everyone. In conjunction with International Women's Day, we are running a month-long campaign to celebrate prominent female Middle Templars in Malaysia. Every week throughout the month, we will be releasing a short episode where our featured Middle Templar will share their success story, challenges that they face along the way, as well as advice to aspiring and young professionals to hashtag break the bias. Our featured Middle Templar for today's episode is a renowned international arbitrator and a powerhouse in the construction industry, Ms. Tan Sui Im. Sui Im needs no introduction. She wears many, many hats, including adjudicator, arbitrator, dispute board member, and mediator. She is also appointed a member of the Advisory Council for the Asian International Arbitration Center, or more commonly known as AIAC. My introduction would not do you any justice um, to your journey to where you are today as an extremely prominent uh, international arbitrator. So Sui Im, for the benefits of our young viewers, why don't you give us a quick overview as to how you get to who you are today right after law school? First and foremost, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you very much to uh, Tinta. And um, I'm a proud Middle Templar, as you know. Today, I'm not wearing my badge, but other times in a lot of the webinars, I do wear my, my, my Middle Temple badge. Um, you gave me a very glowing introduction. Uh, I hope it's deserved. I like to think it is, and I like to believe that it is. And only time will tell, and only all of you will tell whether it is, um, it's good or not. So where, what happened? I left law school convinced, absolutely convinced I was never going to be a lawyer. I went to law school not wanting to be a lawyer. I went through my bar, I went through my chambering and everything else convinced I didn't want to be a lawyer. So what am I 30 plus years down the line? I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so oh, I didn't know that. So obviously there was something that actually hooked me in and kept me here. Uh -huh. and that thing actually was construction because I fell into it just by accident. I'm a Jimbury student and I really enjoyed it because, you know, for of us, for most of us lawyers, it's pushing paper. Construction, you push paper, but there is something that you can see, you can touch, you can feel, and there are many stories behind it. And that gave it life, that gave the law and the matter life to me. And I have to say that I've been extremely, extremely fortunate because I fell into that by, as a chambering student way back when in the late 80s. And I have had just wonderful experience, experiences since then that has led to where I am today. So I spent um, two years as an LA in a, a large local law firm. And then after that, I went into, I went in-house to for three years in, in a public listed company. At that point in time, that public listed company, which today is very, very big and very international, but those were the early days when they were just about to expand. So we had really interesting projects. I mean, I worked on the first independent power plants. I worked on airports. I, 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 know I worked on projects in, in far found places like Papua New Guinea and South Africa. I mean, those days now, who would ever go to those places? And I was given these wonderful opportunities. But it just got... I was just even more fortunate after that because I left that and went uh, into another local law firm and I spent half a day in that office and I was shipped out to be seconded to the KL International Airport Project. Wow. And there I was placed there for two years and I worked actually under the supervision and alongside senior partners and senior associates from what was then um, the number one construction law firm in the world. Again, I mean, who falls into an opportunity of that nature at that age? And to be on a project where you're nation building as a Malaysian was a very, very proud moment. And today I, I use KLIA, I still feel that, that sense of pride, you know? And then it's, it, it was very fortunate because that same firm was also handling the Malaysia-Singapore second crossing, you know, the bridge? Yeah. And I worked on the contracts for that as well. I mean, I remember my first site visit 
um, it was kampongs and little streams and rivers those days. I mean, nothing like what you see today. So again, when I drive across that bridge, it's like absolutely amazing. I went from there to being a, a partner in a local law firm, a, a, a salaried partner, and I was supposed to start the construction department there. And I was at one at that stage, just that one person department. And it so happened that um, I had some expat friends. And next thing you know, one thing led to the other. And I was acting for most of the foreign construction companies that were in Malaysia. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was acting for the Germans, the Japanese, the Brits, whatever. It was just the Australians, absolutely amazing, really fantastic. And also, uh, I had worked on uh, two airports outside of Malaysia. One was in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. we were, I worked on the privatization of Bochentong International Airport. Wow. And that, that time soon after that as well uh, that same company was starting to look into building a design and build airport in Myanmar in Yangon um, but Myanmar and those foreign contractors all came to a halt when the 1997 Asian financial crisis hit and basically everybody left Malaysia <laughs> I see yeah. such an interesting story I didn't, I didn't know that you never wanted to be a lawyer actually this is uh, something new to me and I am very happy for you that you managed to find construction as something that you love and have passion for and also um, continue to build since a young age until where you are today. So since we are on the note of talking about the past, like why don't we do this session in a chronological uh, manner? So being a woman in the construction industry, where many would actually think that it's a male-dominated industry, please share with us on whether you have personally experienced any gender-specific challenges back in the day. Absolutely, 100%. Um, first and foremost, it was, as you say, it's not perceived. It was, and I think still is, a very, very male-dominated industry. So. For me, in those days, I was pretty much the only female in any of the gatherings that we go to, any of the arbitrations that we go to. I will say one thing, though, is that construction took me into arbitration. So that was like, in a way, a safe space. Mm -hmm. But those days, uh, arbitration was nothing like what it is today. And so most of the arbitrators were like architects and engineers, older, therefore, I mean, older than me at that stage. So you can imagine that it, it was a different mindset. Mm -hmm. And it really was um, fairly tough like, in that sense, you know. And there are many, many an evening where I came back from a full day of arbitration hearing and, and absolute tears, having been, what I felt was in a way bullied. I don't think they saw it that way. So don't get me wrong. It wasn't that, that people were being nasty to me, but it was just that they were just being themselves, which was very, mm -hmm. very like, male dominant, shall we say. Yeah. yeah it was uh, there were days that were really really tough mm -hmm. but you know you you get to know a lot of people you get into the swing of things and actually uh, to, to, at, at one stage I became an honorary boy I was kind of accepted into the club <laughs> oh how actually uh, we would love to know how you overcome all those challenges and hashtag break the bias in your experience <laughs> I, I guess it was being immersive. I mean, I just immersed myself. Into it. I, I, I truly enjoyed what I was doing. I really did enjoy it. And, you know, I really enjoyed clomping around uh, construction sites and actually understanding what's going on. It, it wasn't just a put on, I got to do this. I, I enjoyed it. I, I got to know uh, a lot of people because of that. Uh, a lot of clients became friends. And uh, some of my early clients are still lifelong friends until today. Um, some of my closest friends, you know, are, are from the construction industry because of that. So I think that, you know, that that obviously helps. It wasn't just a job that you go to and you survive your way through it. You're very immersive. And having said that, um, I mean, there were some times when you sort of, you, you had to do certain things and, and act in a, in a particular way to kind of belong. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I will say to you, I always wore my skirts. I never wore trousers. Why is that? <laughs> Just make a statement, you know. 
<laughs> you can you can treat me as an honorary boy, but here I am in in, in a skirt, and, and my skirts were uh, those days when I was much younger, a little bit short. I, Even, see. I, I used to some I used to get the be the only female that got invited to a particular boys tennis game on on a Monday evening. Wow. And, you know, normally, normally you go wear shorts. You go wear shorts, right? Nah, I would. I will make sure that I wore a tennis skirt, not a short, not yeah. short, just to make a statement. That's great. That's great. I think that's uh, really something that is uh, admirable. <laughs> the fact that um, you want to make a statement to them showing that, look, regardless, I'm here and, you know, wearing my skirt and that's still being great at what I do, right? I think that's, that's really um, impressive. <laughs> So um, interesting to hear about um, the past challenges that you have in the construction mm. industry. Why don't we move a little bit forward to where we are right now, the present time mm. in 2022 right now. Well, there may be a lot more female, uh, young female graduates actually, and uh, young female practitioners. It appears that the management level or the upper tier of most major law firms is still very much male dominated. Do you think gender diversity has improved across the years or do you think the same type of biasness you experienced back then is still there, be it in the legal or the construction industry? You make very astute observances. I think that those are very factual observances and I would agree with you and also go on to say that I believe gender bias is still very much there. Don't get me wrong, we've done a long way since um, you know, my time or, or even my parents' time for that matter. We've come a long way, but it's a good start to what they always say. But this is a good start. It's going on for too long. Uh, I think that we have actually got to move off this. It's a good start. We're doing this. We believe in this. We've actually got to walk the talk. And um, this is something which, which should be our focus now about moving it forward and make it real rather than just talking about it. You know, talking about it was a good start. Yep. Let's do it. And we're not, we're doing it with not that we don't do it at all. It's just that I think perhaps more needs to be done. And let's face it, yeah, we are an Asian patriarchal society where uh, the firstborn son at the end of the day may still be the favorite of um, daddy and mommy because he is the firstborn son. And I came to realize that that may be our perception, and it's true, but actually that is also something that is held in many, many different cultures across the world. I see. Yeah. I think on, on that point where you, you mentioned about the firstborn son, it, I, it, I had a shock of my life when I found out that my cousin, who was, uh, I hope he's not watching this, uh, <laughs> my cousin, who is the only male um grandson in the family is considered a fourth son of my grandparents. So this is something really um, shocking to me because I felt like living in the 21st century, I, I didn't know that this kind of uh, tradition still exists or is still implemented by even my family myself. And when I ask about the reason or the rationale behind um, why this is being implemented or what is the story behind it, you know? No one could give me a, a very uh, convincing answer, which makes it even more um, annoying. And I mean, like why, you know? It's in the 21st century and it's down to the people like um, us, like my parents even, like, and also our generation to try to um, move past that, you know, trying to see what is the rationale behind that and whether or not we want to make decisions based on those. Um, and Nicole, you make a good point about what are the attitudes of your generation, because I think that we also must bear in mind that it's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street, okay? Yeah. Now, after I, after, after I um, came out as a partner, I was telling you about the 1997 crisis and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, what I went on to do, actually, was in 1999, at the age of 35, I started my own law firm. Yep. And I was a sole proprietor. It was me, my laptop, and those days I was driving a Jeep, and that was it. That was the law firm. But that law firm, you know, it, was, it, it lasted about roughly 20 years before I moved on to just being a third-party neutral. And during that 20 years, 
I would, I'm an employer. Mm -hmm. So as much as I believe in women and giving them their, their due opportunities, but yeah. they have to perform as well. And the mm -hmm. two things that I actually would point out is that the first one is that there's a lot of women who don't want too much responsibility because they do want to have time for their family, which perhaps was not totally compatible with the demands of work. So I think that you we, we cannot just say, oh, I want it, but you don't give it to me because mm -hmm. some people don't want it. Now, the other issue, of course, is maternity leave. I, it's it's their right and, and it's correct because without maternity leave and without mothers, I mean, none of us are here. Yeah, but agreed. it does actually and can, if not managed properly, create an issue as well. I have only once in my entire life not uh, slept all night because I was so panicked about some work. And that was because my trusted, trusted um, associate was going on maternity leave and she hadn't turned everything over to me yet. Mm -hmm. And I was just terrified that she would go into labor and I wouldn't have the stuff that I needed to go ahead in a very, very um, urgent situation that we were in. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean that it's, it's not all one way. Yeah, I, so I agree with you, actually. I think that's a really good point that, that you made. Um, uh, even you, in my peers, my friends, you know, colleagues, and the people that I meet in the industry, um, or even outside of the industry, I still get a lot of uh, comments where um, obviously they had to turn down certain opportunities because they need to be with their family, which is fine. I mean, as long as you are making a decision um, that is informed, and you are fully aware of the consequences that, that comes with um, the, the decision that you are making and also whatever that you are taking and losing, you need to weigh that and then make the decision. So I, I completely agree with you. So in that, in, on that note, all right, I think um, we still have a lot to work on, I believe. I think that's the one thing that we can take away from, from this conversation. Yeah. Right, let's take a turn um, onto your portfolio. Actually, a glance at your portfolio would show that you have vast experiences in the international platform, like, like what you mentioned earlier, working with different countries and uh, different bodies globally. So is getting international exposure is something that may be seen as something rare and really honoured to have in the legal industry. Would you like to share with us on how you managed to get this international exposure in your career and how you maintain it? I think that it comes down, in my particular case, it was just a very fortunate um, entry into the international arena at quite a young age. You see, I, I was just given those opportunities because of the nature of the firm and the companies I work with. And once you start having that kind of international exposure, then you get known a little bit internationally, then you get to know other people, and then you know, one thing leads to the other. I, I recognize that uh, uh, just a few years ago, just before lockdown, uh, there was a gathering of, of um, women lawyers and that there were some people there who were extremely bright, extremely motivated, extremely capable, but were in the firm that did nothing but local sale and purchase agreements. They had absolutely no opportunity to have international experience and they didn't. So how do you get it? Well, actually you've got to put yourself in the arena where you are able to, to um, capitalize on opportunities that there may be and you've got to grab them. Again, coming back, I mean, it, it may be a situation whereby a young male associate is asked to go to, at a drop of a hat, asked to go to Bangkok, let's say, somewhere mm -hmm. said, oh, it goes, yep, no problem, I'm off. A young mother may say that I can't because, you know, I've got my young baby and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I, I remember having one associate, she was actually seconded out to a particular project in Jakarta for, I can't remember now, it must have been a month or so. And she did have a young baby, but she went. Oh. She absolutely went. And she was actually, um, she was breastfeeding at that time. So yeah. she was actually making sure that she was expressing the breast milk <laughs> in the fridge. 
I see. Yeah. So you know that that that's many ways of doing things. And look, I've I don't have children, so I've never been put in that kind of difficult situation. But many people are. Yeah, I I do agree with you. Um, I mean. I've seen my sister. She's a working mother. She has uh, two children, and the pandemic was an absolute nightmare for her because she has to work, right? And she has to work from home with her laptop and two kids bugging her, running around the the house. And of course, then there there are teachers who are trying to make sure that the kids are doing their homework. So who do they bug? They bug the parents. So the parents, like my sister, was literally running around wearing hats like a mother, an employee, also a teacher, teach, making sure that their homeworks were done. So I I do agree with you that um, it it's difficult right uh, as a woman, especially as a as a mother, um, mm. even and when especially when you're a working mother, um, but. I do agree that there are ways around it. Maybe we need help from other people, so then we will try to seek as much assistance as we can. Um, communicate with the people around us, family, friends, bosses, even in the workplace. Trying to reach um, a consensus or something that is agreeable between both parties, then we can work it out together, right? I think that sort of communication is really quite essential. And I think that there's a lot of bosses out there who are now much more um, amenable to flexible working. I mentioned now uh, one of my trusted associates, and you know when, when she had uh, young babies, she would work after they've, they've they've had their bath and gone to sleep, and you know she work from like eight o'clock at night through to three in the morning, as an example. And you get emails and and stuff that comes in at these odd hours. But the point about this was that, I mean, she was highly, highly diligent, very good at what she did. And she couldn't really um, do, like I said, go to bank, got a drop of a hat. I mean, with planning, you could. So it's, there are ways around it, actually. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that it, it's possible if you want it enough. These are the, going back again to what you were talking about, informed choices. I agree. I agree. I completely agree with you. Um, that's very, very fruitful uh, discussion on, on the present topic. And now maybe we just take a step forward, looking into the future. I think um, having a vision of where we want to be is as important as working towards where we want to be. And also having faith that we will be there one day. Right. So following your, the questions that I had on intercontinental experiences, are there any initiatives that you think Malaysia can adopt on an institutional uh, level through hashtag break the bias in Malaysia? We're doing exactly that today. We are doing that today. The AIAC, the Asian International Arbitration Centre, is actually uh, pretty committed to um, gender diversity as well as age diversity. And at the end of the day, actually, I think that there are, um, there are many, many things that are ongoing in Malaysia, which are in tandem with other things that are going in different countries, and that there is some synergy with all of that. So the issue here is that what are they? How do you find out what they are? How do you take advantage of them? How do you believe in yourself, actually, to really take advantage of them and believe that you can do it? I'm telling you, Nicole, too many times I hear young, bright, fantastic talents who are female, oh, Nola, I don't think I'm good enough. Of course you are. Of course you are. You do have to have that belief. You have to have that, um, that want. And there are those opportunities out there. So what can we do more? We can do more to actually drag these people up by their bootstraps and tell them, Go for it. Go for it. Yes, yeah, to tell them that they are enough, right? And you need you you we we need all these sort of uh, informal type of gatherings where you actually bull each other up and push yeah. each other to do it. Hey, come on, Nicole. Yeah, yeah. Of course you can do it. And then you may say, Oh, well, I'm not sure. Come on, you can do it. And if you are worried about X, Y, Z, give so and so a call. If you want to talk about something, give me a call, and so on and so forth. And we actually did start this kind of thing uh, as an informal gathering um, amongst women. And this is where I said to you, I, I met this young lady, Laura, who had 
absolutely no international exposure. And these are the sort of things that they're, they're like kind of like study groups or kind of like friendship groups that you have in your university or school. And I think they're very, they're very powerful and they're very useful. I, I agree with you. I think having a good support system where we support each other, encourage each other, giving each other the confidence or the push at the right moment. I think that's absolutely essential. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here having this opportunity speaking to you as well. So I'm really grateful for that, actually. Um, on, on my last question, um, I would like to ask you your advice to the young and aspiring uh, practitioners in the arbitration industry who are seeking to further um, hashtag break the bias and make it to the top of the industry like what you've done. Take the opportunities, believe in yourself and take every opportunity that comes your way. Your first arbitration is probably going to be a um, institution appointment. It's going to be extremely small, pay next to nothing. And it may well be something that you know very little about. Take it, learn from it, deal with it. And that will give you your first step and then you have just have to take your baby steps after that but don't be self-entitled because you can't just sit back and say oh, i'm just waiting for i'm just waiting for the next piece of work i'm a woman they should give it to me if they don't know you nobody is going to give you anything if they know you but don't know your capabilities nobody's going to do anything so all these gatherings that we have the conferences the chit chats that we have you often see the guys are all talking to each other and the girls are also hovering in one little corner, not mixing around. What is the point of going to a gathering? Nobody knows you. Nobody knows you. Nobody's going to point you. Nobody's going to ask you to do the next thing. Really, I, 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 I couldn't agree more because you know what they say, right? Your network is your net worth. So really um, putting yourself out there is one of the most essential things that we have to do to in order to be exposed to, to the opportunity before even like just rather than just sitting there and, and wait like what you said. And right? enjoy it. Yeah, that's true. I think that's, that's the most... Enjoy yourself. If you don't enjoy yourself, you're probably in the wrong line of work. work. I mean, it, when I say work, I, I hesitated there because you may still be a lawyer, but this may not be your area. Arbitration may not be your area. Construction may not be your area. International may not be your area. Who knows? Everybody sure. can each their own, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's so right because I think um law is just a very generic um, mm -hmm. area where you can go into so many different industries like technology, construction, yes. energy, uh, even human rights and family law, criminal law. So many things are coming up right now, even you have like cyber law nowadays. So really like if you don't put yourself out there and try different things, you will never know and find out what you are really passionate about. Yes. Right? Right. Yes. So, Ian, thank you so much for your time. I am truly honored, like I said, to have this opportunity to speak with you and to obtain all these nuggets of wisdom from you. And I trust that these experiences and advice that you have given not only helped me, but also all the other young, not young, like professionals out there who are facing some challenges, right? And are continuing to, to hashtag break the bias and to move forward um, together as uh, a nation actually Indeed. So, thank you thank you so much um to thank you for having me and if my own life experiences which were just a mishmash of what just happened in my life as opposed to this grand plan that i had when i came up from law school which is not to be a lawyer right mm -hmm. and these are the opportunities that have come my way and i think that the more you work at it the more opportunities come your way so the harder you work, the luckier you get kind of um, adage. So thank you very much, Nicole. And, you know, all the best for you. Thank you. you. Thank you so much. much. You have a lot ahead of you. And so does every one of you out there. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for the nuggets of wisdom. Um, to all the viewers, please, if you have not checked out our LinkedIn and Facebook page, do that. 
for all the other episodes. Last week, we have our Honourable Justice Nalini, and weeks to come, we have Ms. Farah, Ms. Hanitan, and Ms. Larissa sharing their journey in law. And also, we would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank um, L2 Icon for agreeing to help us and coming on board to be our platform partner. Couldn't have done this without all of you. Um, please like and share this and stay tuned for all the other episodes. Thank you.